So yeah, if you, if you couldn't tell from uh, that fantastic intro, I always love to be on kind of the leading edge of new technologies because I, I find a, a unique passion in helping you know, bring something that is you know, kind of uniquely in the science fiction realm right into a uh, real world application. And so anytime that you have that type of technology evolution, right, there are those punctuating moments throughout time that are pivotal you know, moments in the development of that technology. And so I thought you know, it would be interesting because you've heard a lot of you know, like the applicability and how people are using ML today and AI and, and kind of you know, the, the, the downfalls of not paying attention to it and the things that you can do um, that are amazing with it. But I thought it would be interesting to kind of go through like how we got where we are and then look at how some people are using it out there in the industry and then you know, maybe talk about um, you know, what we need to do or what's going to happen next. And so that's really kind of what today's uh, presentation is about. So you see this, uh, you know, this is a, a bit of JavaScript, right, that was just literally kind of ripped off the web uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, this is how we write software today, right? Computers are really dumb. They're just really fast at being really dumb, right? Um, but the thing is, is it, oh, it wasn't always that way, right? So, um, you know, and if anybody says no on this one, then I'm going to be very sad. But does everybody remember Alan Turing, right? Probably not personally, and, although maybe. Um, but, you know, there was a, a very cool movie about him uh, done recently, what, the, the Imagination? Imitation Game, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I love that movie. And right in that movie when he's trying to, you know, to, to crack the Enigma machine code, right, you know, he's sitting there with those potentiometers, you know, kind of dialing the weights up and down. And that was, you know, really interesting to kind of understand the first you know, how computers really got going from that perspective, right? You know, kind of, um, and then the other interesting thing is, you know, kind of before people started to think about computers as solid state machines, right? There was this conception of a person was a computer, right? That was the other, like, the Hidden Figures movie, right? The, about the women at NASA um, who did all the computations for the NASA flights was just amazing to kind of see, you know, on screen and kind of see how they did that, right? Rooms, you know, this size of desk after desk after desk, right? Where, you know, they have an inbox and an outbox and they, you know, comes in their inbox and they sit down and they do the, their calculations and they hand to the next person to do the next bit of calculations. And that was just, just really amazing to see kind of how that worked. And if you think about kind of what we saw from Alan Turing with, you know, cracking the Enigma, the Enigma code, people wanted to figure out how do they commercialize that, right, after, you know, obviously the war was over. And so there was kind of two camps of thought, if you will. Uh, one of them, the kind of the von Neumann camp, which, which was like, let's take exactly that kind of a concept. Um, let's make it, you know, just really fast at performing simple calculations, you know, the binary ones and zero type calculations. And then there was, you know, kind of the, um, the other camp, which was, you know, let's look at, you know, how do you do it, how do people think, right? So if we can replicate the simple decision type things and do it really, really fast, or we can replicate make, how people actually, um, you know, do the calculations themselves. And so, you know, the idea behind that was, you know, there was a lot of, of science happening around that time, right after the, you know, right after the war itself. And this is kind of a, this is a diagram from there about, you know, it's kind of a typical neuron and what they knew at the time. And you have, you know, kind of the thick and thin ideas up there that, that didn't, um, the, uh, sorry, I'm losing my mind here. D uh, those are the, uh, oh, dendrites, right? The de I can never say that correctly. The, de de ah, the de dendrites, okay? <laughs> and then you have the axions, right, and then the impulse direction. And the idea here was those de de dendrites, right, then, you know, kind of attached to the various different things, you know, like maybe you're, a receptor in your eye or, you know, a bit of uh, when you touch something on your finger and based upon, you know, like, the thickness or thinness, right, that was kind of weighting against that. And if you had enough potential, right, coming in through that, right, then the neuron itself would fire down uh, the, you know, down the axion and, and into the, the rest of uh, the animal at that point. And so when you start to put millions and millions of those things together, that's actually how you get things like perception and you know, the things that we do on a daily basis. And so there was this camp, right, that said, okay, no, let's not just do the binary ones and zeros thing, let's really replicate how we actually think uh, about these things. And so they built 
one of these, and right, and you're really only seeing a, a small bit of it. This is kind of the perceptron, is what it was called, and it was kind of an artificial eye to kind of see, hey, does this kind of theory work? And so what you're missing on this side over here, you kind of see a little bit of it, is were these like dish-sized, you know, plate-sized plate cameras, or it was a grid of 20 by 20 of these things. And what you're seeing in this spaghetti mess over here was they're kind of their artificial neurons that were connected to those. And so the idea on this one was they, they kind of pointed this camera array at different objects to see if they could build a model through you know, their artificial neurons there to kind of understand what it was seeing. And so they pointed it like at a tank, is that a, you know, what is that? Or they pointed at, you know, a person on a bicycle, and what was that? The problem was, is, you know, this is a 20 by 20 array. By the way, it, it failed miserably, right? But they pointed it at these things, and, and a 20 by 20 grid, with each one of those being equivalent to a kind of a pixel, if you will, is a really terrible way to try and identify anything. Because you know, think about think about trying to look through a peephole the size of a checkbox in Excel, right? And trying to identify what things are, right? It's it's really really difficult. So obviously this failed miserably. And out of this, um, you know, the idea was is that uh, you, there was uh, a book written by uh, Minsky, right? Um, after this one, that by Marvin Minsky, you know, chair of science at MIT, that said this is a terrible idea, right? This will never work. Right, you should never ever do this. And so obviously the, then the von Neumann camp won, won, right, in a sense, and so that's how we ended up with computers the way that we have them today. But there was always those people that said, nope, I'm gonna stick by my guns and I really think, right, this neural model of computing is the way that we should be doing things. And you know, those kind of, you know, those academics, the people in the industry that really believe that kind of, oops, kept thinking that that was the way that they were going to do it and that the von Neumann model, right, would, would eventually, you know, kind of peter out. And so, you know, von Neumann won. We all use those type of computers today, but now we're starting to see the rise of, of, of real neural-based computing. And so let's walk through some, kind of how that happened a little bit. This is probably one of the interesting, um, the most interesting kind of concepts to kind of you know, wrap your head around is like, why is this shift starting to happen. This is uh, done by Ray Kurzweil in about 2006, kind of after that first bubble burst. And what he did is he wanted to look, um, he's always done lots of interesting studies, if, if you've ever read any of Ray Kurzweil's stuff. Um, but it, one of the things that, that he did is he looked at how much computing power can I get for $1,000 through time? And this may look, you know, very gentle, but this is actually a logarithmic scale, right? And, you know, I, hopefully everybody, uh, I'm, I'm sure we're, everybody, unless the math department here is, is worse than mine, that everybody understands what logarithmic scales are, right? Um, and what they found is that, you know, over time, right, computing, especially kind of you, you kind of hit, you know, the Moore's Law area there, and then it kind of starts swinging up, and then Moore's Law starts to die out around 2000. But the, the compute power still continues to climb significantly, right? And the idea behind that is that there are new things that have come out, things like GPUs, and we'll talk about that here in a second, um, quantum computing, right? All of these things are projected to continue that curve. So compute power, even though it may not just be the standard type of CPU, type of you know, binary calculation type of concept, that's probably not gonna be the thing that carries us forward um, into the future. It will be these other computing paradigms, right? Massively parallel computing. Um, quantum computing, right, uh, GPU type of things, right, that actually uh, take us there. But this is really, really interesting, and the, you know, the idea behind this is, you know, we've been really good at understanding kind of, you know, or, or being able to deliver things that look and feel, right, like machine learning and AI based upon standard processors um, to a certain point. But now we're actually starting to get, um, with some new innovations, you know, past where we would be able to go with just the von Neumann style of computer. This is the first one. This is like the big, like, boom type of thing that happened, right? Does everybody understand what a GPU is, a graphics processing unit, right? Originally built for video games, right? So on the left here is like when, you know, when I played Doom, right, and, you know, uh, 10 years ago, it looked really crummy, and I was pretty excited about that because, you know, coming from the Atari days, right, and, you know, Pong, right? Now, this is like this is like magic, right? Magic. But if I show when I show this to, this kind of stuff to my kids today, they're like, 
well, what are you doing, right? You know, are, we, are we rolling back 20 years, Dad? Are you, are you bringing back the, the golden oldies for me or what? And you know, when my kids play video games, they want photorealism, right? They want the monsters with the, the hair that flows. They want to see you know, uh, the, the realistic you know, you know, physics in their games, right? They want to see waterfalls that look like waterfalls, right? And the only way to go do that, right, the, the, process, the reason that we went on the left was not through lack of imagination, it was through lack of processing power. And so what you had is you had this company called NVIDIA, about 2009, I think it was, who took um, this idea and they're like, hmm, well, we don't have enough processing power to kind of go through this and, and you know, kind of render the whole thing to any greater detail than we have here, even with this exponential growth, right, the doubling of processing power every year. So what if we just did this? And they took kind of a, like a graph paper and laid it over top of this and said, hey, what if we break it down into lots and lots of smaller calculations? And so what they did is they said, hmm, in each one of these squares of the graph paper, let's drop a processor in there that's just really good at doing the math for triangles, right, for pixels, and we'll do that. And so then they came up with the first GPU. And so what they did is they said, instead of trying to tackle this thing as one big problem, we'll tackle it as millions of small problems, right, that are really, really fast, and then we'll just combine them all together at the end. And that takes us to this gentleman. This is Jeff Hinton, right? He's kind of one of those people that Marvin Minsky said, don't pay attention to, right? He's crazy. And so, you know, he believed, right, in that kind of neurally inspired approach to computing um, where every concept, right, that people perceive or that people do in actions was essentially could be broken down to kind of a point in space calculation. And so, you know, we like to imagine, right, that, you know, kind of Jeff in 2009 kind of saw, you know, maybe his, his grandkids or other teenagers playing on these, you know, PlayStations, other things. And he had this epiphany, right, where he said, huh, I could do something with that. And this is the, the start of his second career at the, at the point in time. I think he's a professor at University of Toronto, as well as spends about half his time at Google itself. And so, you know, what he did is he said, hmm. He said, you know, you kind of see this thing at the lower right here? He's like, I can create an artificial neuron, right? I can create the black lines are the inputs, the red dots are assigning weights, it's the potentiometer type of idea, and then the big blue thing is actually the neuron itself, right, that fires the output. And the idea was here is that as the inputs come in, right, and as the weights are dialed up and down, if it becomes a net positive number, integer, once it hits the big blue dot, that blue dot will fire, right? and then connect to the other ones. And so what he found is that, huh, if I can combine that GPU with this style of computing, and he did all the math for this, and basically what he said is, you know what, the GPU math that we use to calculate those pixels is so similar to what we would use for this type of concept that he was able to use the GPUs directly. And so what he came up with was this. Again, big turning point. So he said, hmm, if I can now take multiple GPUs and I can create in each one of those cells, if you will, one of those, each one of those pixel areas, kind of that artificial neuron, and I can start to layer them on top of each other, then I get some very fantastic things to happen. And so what he did is he created this thing, um, you know, kind of, which is, you know, a multi-layered neural network. So the idea here is he said, okay, if I'm taking, going back to the perceptron days, right, I think, you know, probably had an ax to grind um, with, with the, his, uh, other academics on this one. He said, okay, I'm gonna take photos of European speed limit signs, right? And I'm going to run that through this multi-layer neural network. Um, and I am then going to basically, you know, if, if the answer that I get out the other side um, you know, is correct, then great, then I have my weight set correctly. If the answer is not correct, then I'm gonna dial up those potentiometers, right, in each one of these different layers of the network until I start to get, you know, high confidence of lots and lots of these speed limit signs, right, that is giving out the right answer, right? And the idea here is that, you know, 
sitting there as a person like, you know, like the Alan Turing style of, you know, turning up and down these potentiometers, right, is a really slow approach to getting this and probably not terribly valuable. But because these GPUs were able to crank through this so fast, he could run millions of iterations of this, automatically having it adjust those, those weights on each one of these in such a, uh, you know, so, such a short period of time that he was able to start getting the right answers almost immediately. Recognizing speed limit signs was, was pretty cool, but you know, it's amazing and it, it probably made for a great paper and maybe a, you know, hey, in your face, Minsky, right, kind of thing. But, you know, um, this, this area of science still hadn't really proved its value, if you will, right? And it was still kind of looking for, you know, what are those right, you know, what right impl uh, implementations, right, that, that really kind of prove the value of these types of neural networks. And so fast forward to another person, Fei-Fei Li um, at Stanford. Um, she was again in the, in the, you know, the Minsky crazy camp, right, of neural um, people that were kind of you know, looking at computing from a, a neural perspective. And Fei-Fei um, took, I think it was, what is it, 15 million, yeah, I couldn't remember the actual number, 15 million images and tagged them, right? I mean, I've met Fei-Fei, right? um, she works at Google. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna find that a lot of these people um, We've hired them because we use a lot of uh, AI and ML in what we do, and we, we foster their, their research. But Fei-Fei, while she was at Stanford, took 15 million images. I can't even imagine uh, how long it took. And if you met Fei-Fei, you'd be like, okay, did you sleep any time in the past 10 years? And, and probably not. And so she took 15 million images, and she labeled those. And so she and Jeff got together, right? And she used those images as training for his neural network, right? So not just signs, right? And so when they started feeding these in, the idea was is they were gonna feed these images in, one side, train the neural network, and then point them at, at images that had not been trained. And on the output side, right, as you get these neurons firing, right, the output, like in humans or in animals, it's some sort of action, I'm speaking, I'm feeling, right, I'm moving. The output of this one was just gonna be simple words, right, a simple math equation. Like, Give me words that describe what is actually in the image. And so, you know, success is like the top left one, right? And the idea is that they wanted this, they wanted to get to the perception level of a three-year-old, right? That was kind of their goal, right? Let's not try and go too crazy here. Like a three-year-old's probably great. And so how do we, you know, they, they ran all these images through and trained it like, like three-year-olds come to understand the world around them from a visual perspective. And so they fed like this whole series of images in there and like this, this one in the top left corner, right? You know, it's a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Great, they nailed that one, right? And then, you know, if you kind of look at some of the other ones, right? If you kind of look at the, you know, two dogs playing in the grass, well, mostly correct, but just like a three-year-old, right? Some mistakes would have been made, right? So you would naturally then go correct that, right? No, it's not two, you know, my son, my Evan, my youngest. No, Evan, it's not three, two dogs, it's three dogs. But yes, they're playing in the grass. And then sometimes you just got it, you know, kind of way out of whack because maybe the training materials weren't there. Same thing, like, you know, the, the one in the lower right corner, a little girl, right, and a pink hat is blowing bubbles. Well, you know, obviously, you know, three-year-olds get as confused as anybody else does, and if they have never seen somebody blowing bubbles before, as an example, or maybe they've seen a wrong image of somebody blowing bubbles, then they can make mistakes too, and so obviously you, you need to correct for that. And so, you know, the idea here was, you know, very, very important is that, you know, we, machine learning will perceive like us, right? It will learn like humans do, but just much, much faster, so it's going to make mistakes. And so you, one of the things was, is like, okay, so how do you, you know, without having to continually feed lots and lots of images or tagged material to it, how do you start to get this learning process kind of kick-started in such a way that it isn't quite so hand-fed hand each time? And that was in uh, 2012 is kind of when this action started to take place. But even with that, right, if with that simple learning there were unique applications to that, right? Especially if you understand, so one of the problems that you have with that kind of like, I will point it at anything and hopefully it will give me kind of the right analysis of what's happening, is when you have no context, right? And it's just kind of free guessing on what it, uh, what it is seeing. 
But in this type of sense, right, it was really easy from a machine learning perspective, if you understand the context of what you're looking at, to be able to do amazing things. And so you have these guys um, that started a startup called Planet Labs, and essentially what they did is this thing that the, the guy's holding, is, it's essentially kind of like an iPhone in a little box with some solar panels, and they would start chucking them out of the back of space stations and you know, like whatever else went up into space at the time that they could you know, get a, a couple of uh, cubic meters of, of space on and just, you know, these things, you know, they would toss them out of the back of whatever was being launched, right? And eventually they you know, kind of stabilize, and, and they essentially they do line scans of the Earth. Right, very narrow line scans of the Earth. And they were looking for, you know, they thought they had a couple of really good ideas on it, but one of the applications that popped up was taking those images, which they, and they're happening right now, right? They line scan the Earth, I think they have full coverage of the Earth every couple of hours or so, give or take. And so what they did is, um, does anybody recognize what those round circles are around? Oil tanks, exactly. Does everybody know kind of with an oil tank, you have um, essentially a, a floating roof <clears throat> that sits on top of the oil itself because uh, if anybody's ever done the experiment where you, know, you take a lot of uh, liquid volume out of something that is kind of an immovable object, what does it do? It goes, <coughs> it crunches together, right, just due to the vacuum itself. And so they've solved that problem with the, the movable roof. Well, what's one thing that you notice, and this is a, a good human thing, as the roof from a perception perspective, you'll probably get this intuitively, but as that roof is at the top, what happens to the shadow? No shadow. No shadow. What happens as it goes lower and lower? The shadow deepens, right? You get a larger shadow. And so essentially what they did is they took that machine learning aspect with the context of these are circles, they are oil tanks, I need to know how big the shadows are. And that how big that shadow is, right, the larger the shadow, the lower the volume of oil in that tank. And they were able to write a machine learning algorithm that could forecast exactly what the world's oil supply was at any given point in time. The hedge funds went nuts, <laughs> right? The commodities market went crazy. So there was a company that um, actually did it, some former uh, Googlers that uh, you know, bailed out to make some really good cash um, called Orbital Insight that went and did that uh, machine learning along with the uh, LaPlana Labs guys. And just the funding from that alone, right, has set Orbital Insight up for, to do more and more and more and more innovation, right? So simple, simple things, right? You didn't even need to go through a massive training regimen for these, right, because you had a simple context. But again, there's still, you know, greater things to come. Meet Demis. So <laughs> Demis is, is interesting. So childhood genius. Grand chess master at age 12, right? Uh, loved games, obviously, um, but, and so he decided that he wanted to write games of his own. But the problem is, if you're a childhood genius and you're a grand chess master at age 12, you very quickly figure out, you know, what the trick is to most games. And so his idea was, well, I want the game to, to be more random, more human-like. And so he built a game um, called Theme Park. Right, which had a lot of different, you know, basically it was like, you, like the Sims, right? You go, you build a theme park with rides and exhibits and all sorts of things, and all of the, the character actors in it, like the individual people or the children, were AI driven. And the more that liked your rides, the better the score that you got. And he thought, wow, that was fantastic, but he made millions on this. So he retired at age 20 um, and decided to go back to school to really study uh, this thing, you know, this um, kind of emerging field of, of computational neuroscience. And his thesis had, a major, had some major breakthroughs, and let me kind of characterize them for you a little bit, um, although he, he would probably be really upset um, with me kind of dumbing him down like this. But one of the things that, Den uh, that Demis did is he studied the hippocampus, right? Hippocampus is about, you know, the size of your pinkyish or so, and it sits in your brain, um, and it's the thing that kind of pumps dopamine into your into your brain and your bloodstream. And dopamine, for those of you who don't know, is like the high. It's the really exciting thing that you get when you do something awesome, right? And it also gives you those cold sweats when you do something really, really bad, right? And the hippocampus is also in charge of, you know, when you sleep at night and you dream and it's replaying your day, it's training you at that point on what worked and what didn't work. 
right, evolutionary biology at work here. It's also responsible for kind of those, those mini daydreams that you have during the day, not the ones where you're like, I'm laying on the beach drinking margaritas, but the ones where you kind of quickly go through, if you're given a choice of a couple possibilities, and sometimes you don't even realize you do this, if you're given a choice of a couple possibilities, you kind of run through the scenarios in your head and pick the one that you think is going to be the best one. And basically what it does is it kind of replays itself to go, okay, you know, based upon past interactions and if I were to slot that same learning into this, uh, this one, this choice is going to be the best. And so he said, well, hmm, what if I could do that for computers, right? So one of the things he realized is that, you know, dopamine itself creates champions, right? It's the thing that drives you to be the best in your sport. It's the thing that drives, you know, the, you know, well, I guess it's a not, not in more at sea world, but, you know, the thing, dopamine was the thing that drove, you know, the, the um, what are those giant killer whales, right, to jump up and catch, grab the fish out of the, you know, the, the person's hand, right? Dopamine is what drives people to make better and better decisions. So he thought, hmm, well, how do I get that to happen on computers? And so he kind of came up with his, this, his concept of kind of general AI, which is, you know, kind of if you look at this from a counterclockwise perspective, is you have some sort of observation in the environment, right? And that observation then goes into a system of, of trying to, you know, generate the right goal, right? Whatever the outcome that you're looking for is, you know, don't fall off the stage or, you know, don't touch the hot stove or, you know, yes, you tell your wife she looks great in those jeans, like whatever those things are, right, that keep you out of trouble or they get you going in the right direction, right? And then, you know, based upon, you know, whatever that goal is, you drive some sort of action, right? And then out of that action, it's either gonna be positive or you know, negative, and you should reinforce that action as being a good one or a bad one, right? And it's kind of this circular feedback loop. And so he thought about that, he's like, hmm, this is a really good idea. If I can generate, you know, this type of hippocampus high, if you will, in computers and how they learn, I can get past that problem of having to constantly feed in, you know, new information and then tell if it was good or it was bad each time, right? And so now I take you to what we call the $500 million demo, right? Everybody remember Breakout? So what he did is he took that concept of his neural network with this positive feedback, this weighting, and he applied it to, by the way, you know, he just, he was terrible at, at things like robotics, right? So he figured, like, how do I do something that shows observation and action, right, but doesn't necessarily rely on me having to go build a robot to do, you know, kind of the things uh, that people do. So he's like, <laughs> computer games, right? I mean, obviously that's where the guy came from, and, you know, most nerds uh, like us really love computer games. And so we picked a simplistic one here, breakout. So the, uh, the object of breakout, for those of you who don't know, is you, you, know, you, you bounce that little ball up um, to break the, uh, the individual blocks, and then the more blocks you break without losing the ball, right, the, the higher your score. And so what his weighting here was is he said, okay, um, by the way, the only actions you get, right, as the outcome of this model is left or right, it only understood left or right, up or down or diagonal, right, from, a, from an observation perspective, and the perception of score. And then the only actions it could take were left or right. And so he started training this model with a, you know, a positive hippocampus feedback, if you will, um, if it got the higher score in the shortest amount of time, right? So essentially score over time. And what he found is that, you know, in about 10 minutes, right, it was just random luck. The thing just sucked, right? And so, but because you can run this at millions and millions of iterations, look what happened after 120 minutes, right? It was playing flawlessly, right? Never lost the ball, score kept going up, left it running. At 240 minutes, strategy emerges, right? This is just an amazing, Thing. And what it found is, if I can build a tunnel on one of the edges and get the ball above the blocks, it works for me, right? My score, there's just no way to get a higher score than that in a short period of time. So two hours is all it took 
for this machine learning algorithm with these feedback mechanisms to beat humans, hands down. The reason I call it the $500 million demo is because that's what he showed to found DeepMind, which again bought, uh, is now funded by, by, by Google. And then he went and applied that to pole position. And again, you know, first 50 games or so, terrible, right? Crashed all the time. By the 51st game, it was flawless, right? Interesting, but then what about real world applications? Meet GeoHot, George Hotz. You may know him, uh, that GeoHot was his handle when he was uh, age 14 cracking iPhones, uh, jailbreaking those so that people could you know, side load whatever applications they wanted on there. He made a ton of money at that. Uh, FBI didn't like him very much, nor did Apple, um, but that, you know, he's a hacker, right? And that's what he does. And he said, he saw that demo for pole position. He's like, well, that sounds pretty cool, but I want to try it in real life. And so what he did is he looked for, like, how can I go do that, right? So he needed to find a cheap car that was drive-by-wire. Everybody knows what drive-by-wire is, right? If you're pressing on the gas, you're not actually doing the throttle in the engine yourself. You're sending an electrical impulse through the little CPU in the car to go turn the throttle. If you're turning the wheel right, you're not actually doing the rack and pinion type of thing on the it actually sends an electrical impulse to a motor that actually does that turn for you. Acura, found a, Acura was the cheapest car he could get that actually had drive-by wire. And so what he did is he took, you can kind of see it down here, he took the joystick um, front that he was using on, tet, on that uh, pole position game along with uh, a small computer and a screen and installed it in there and hacked his way into the system so that when he turned the joystick to the left, the car turned left. When he turned it to the right, it went right. When he pushed it forward, it accelerated. When he pulled it back, it braked. And you know, when he pulled the firing uh, trigger, it, it disengaged the system so he could you know, um, make sure they didn't crash. I'm, I'm glad he chose that rather than something else. You never know with these guys. Um, and what he found is that you know, he took the same code from pole position, a couple hundred lines, right? And put it into the system and it drove better than applications with several hundred thousand lines of code. And in fact, you can look at a demo of this today. He's actually open sourced it all. If you go to comma, C-O-M-M-A dot A-I, um, he has this thing called Open Pilot or Open Driver or something like that. And in the demo that's right there on the main screen, he takes something the size of an iPhone, probably it's like a Raspberry Pi type of thing, co probably cost you, with a camera, probably cost you, I don't know, 150 bucks to go build it and install it in your car if you can you know, hack through this kind of stuff. And it's equally as good as for, to drive on roads as Mobileye is, which Intel just spent $17 billion for last year, right? And he does it all on something you know, that is so low powered that it costs you 150 bucks or so to build, right? Absolutely amazing. So, but it's not about driving, it's not all about games, it's not about you know, driving uh, uh, vehicles, although those are really cool things. Machine learning can be applied, like you saw in the oil example, to lots of different things. And you know, at Google, we pride ourselves on our data centers. We think we're you know, uh, really, really smart when it comes to running these things. But what we found is that we started to run uh, simulations through machine learning, uh, uh, basically all the data that we had for like what uses what and where workloads are and, and how the, the cooling systems and the power systems are running. And, and the, the goal in a data center is to get something called a PUE as close to one as possible, which means that for every watt that you actually feed into the data center, you get a watt's worth of, of computational power out. And what we found is that while we thought we were really cool um, and really good at this, when we turned machine learning loose on it, you can see this graph at the top. As soon as we turned it on, our utilization, our PUE, our efficiency went up 40%. So it's reflected as a drop on this, which is the drop in our loss, if you will. And the second we turned it off, it went right back to where it was. So that we found is that you know, for these types of tasks, you know, machine learning can do wonderful things, even if they're not as sexy or sophisticated as driving a vehicle down the road. So there's lots of applicability across all portions of our daily lives that we should look at machine learning to help us with. 
And it's not just, you know, those types of things. This one is, is something that I think is amazingly uh, cool. So, you know, we took all of the things that uh, Fei-Fei had done and the things that Jeff had done and, and looked at kind of the state of the art of what was happening out there in machine learning, and we applied that to language processing, to speech processing. You know, kind of up until this point, maybe even just about a year, year and a half ago, you know, language processing, speech to text, or understanding, or translation just was terrible, right? Even if you got, you know, with millions of lines of code, right, because there, it wasn't really machine learning or AI based before this, you would get 95% efficiency, right, or correctness, if you will, on things like translations. But while that sounds great, hey, 95, you know, is an A, right? Um, not so much in this context because it felt like talking to the village idiot, right? You would say something in, in English and it would translate it to French and the, a French speaker would be like, no, that's not anything like what you said, right? All the context was missing. All of the, the things, the nuances were missing. And so what they found is, okay, they took all of the data that we had on how we translated languages and threw it through that neural network. And what they found is a couple of very interesting things happened. One, the efficiency went up so high that the only people on the planet that can translate languages from one to another better than the machine learning model are the interpreters at the UN, right? Which are you know, world renowned for their, their capabilities because the, and the reason for that is is because they can add in colloquialisms and body language. Probably body language that they see is probably the number one additional weighting, if you will, that they have. And so the efficiency on this is up around 99 point something percent. If we could figure out a way to interpret body language at the same time, I'm sure it would be almost on par uh, with those translators. Another interesting thing happened is when we let these neural networks loose on translating from English to French and French to Spanish and you know, there's 110 languages that, um, that it can translate between, it actually built its own language in the middle, right? So it said, hey look, translating from, you know, English, or from Spanish into English and then English into French is a dead end street, right? Don't do that, it's a really bad idea. Very computationally ineffective and you know you pick up a whole list of bad things right when you go do that right wrong words right you know errors creep in that sort of thing so it came up with its own language in the middle um, that was rich with metadata about the languages that it was coming from and going to and that was not something our programmers uh, put in there it came up with that on its own and that's what actually drove um, it over the top on the you being able to translate those different speeches and one of the things I find you know, really interesting with this is, um, and again, this is not a product placement, but just an, an understanding of kind of like what you can do with this stuff today. Um, there are, we've released one, I think others have released one based upon this technology that you can have earbuds in your ear with your phone that will translate in real time what it's hearing from people talking to you in a different language. And then when you talk, it will translate and speak out through your speaker of your phone in their native language. So think about what that's going to do for interactions um, between students, between students and teachers, um, between, you know, for the business world, for just, you know, being able to go on vacation, right? I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. And this is just one small, you know, very concrete example of how machine learning can actually make our lives much, much richer and much better. Brings us to here, right? So, We've gotten to the point where machine learning can do amazing things. You can, you can do these really cool feedback loops that, that help the training, right, get better at a much faster pace. But there was still this kind of, you know, we call it intuition or gut feel that these machines just didn't have, right? And so, you know, again, you know, Demis and, and the guys at DeepMind um, decided, hmm, so far we can do games, we can do self-driving cars, we can do speech recognition. Um, you know, but how do we deal with business? And how do we deal with things that are much more complex, where you have to have that instinct or the gut feel, right? Is that something that we can replicate in machine learning and AI itself? And so what they did, again, you know, Demis likes his games. And so he turned to what is inarguably the most complex game on the planet, a game called Go, 
right? It's huge in Asia. Um, you know, people you know, drop out of school to go become you know, master Go players, and they're revered across their country and you know, paid millions of dollars right, to be that person. And, and probably the, the best one that's out there is, is a guy named uh, Lee Sodal right now. And if you were to ask Lee, right, and by the way, the number of moves in Go outweigh the number of atoms in the universe, the number of potential moves in Go, right? And so if you go and you ask somebody like Lee, hey, are you winning right now? He'll look at the board and go, yeah, I think so. And, they'll, and you say, well, how do you know that? He's like, well, I've got a gut feel that I'm winning. And you ask him, how is he going to make his next move? Well, I'm going to do this. Well, how do you know to do that? My intuition tells me that I'm going to go do that. And so, hmm, OK. So they said, how do, Demis and his team said, how do I go build gut instinct or intuition right, into machine learning? And so they essentially tweaked their, you know, the, the, the deep learning uh, neural network, and they created it into two concepts. One is, how do I find out a gut instinct for how I'm doing so far? And how do I figure out the gut instinct or the intuition for what my next move is going to be? And then they coupled them together. And so what they did is they went back right, um, to Lee, and they said, OK. Well, first of all, what they did is they had two separate, or actually hundreds of separate versions of this playing against each other, right? So they ingested all of the previous games that they could find into the learning model, and then they set them loose on each other, right? Again, with that feedback loop that if you win the game, or you are right about your intuition for a move, or you're right about your intuition for where you are at that certain point in time, you get that you know, high, that, that positive plus in the, in the AI feedback back loop. And so they set them loose on each other for millions and millions of iterations. And then they said, hey, Lee, we want you to play um, our AI. And so the first, uh, first game, you know, Lee won hands down. Right? He, there's no way he's going to let a machine beat him at Go. Right? So they went back to the drawing board, right? tweaked some of their weighting, ingested more and more and more games, set them loose to play, set the AIs against each other to play you know, a couple million more rounds. And then they went back to Lee. Right? And they said, hey, we want to play you again. And so what happened was, the second time around, it beat Lee four to zero. Beat him four games. He didn't win one. And in fact, one of the things that it did, again, going back to this like, crazy intuition that you know, these types of machine learning properly done can, can create, is it created a whole new strategy for Go called the fifth column strategy, which no one had ever seen before. And in fact, it went against everything that Go players were taught up until now. But it so flustered Lee in the first game that he saw it, he had to get up and walk out of the room to collect himself. It blew him away. He had never seen it before, and he knew hands down that it was going to kill him. And so he's like, OK, I've got to leave for a minute. Like, and he, so he literally walked out of the room, composed himself, and came back in, and still promptly got beat 4 to 0. And now, Go players across the world are learning the fifth column methodology for playing Go. So not only can machine learning, right, the thing to take from that is, is you know, when you can compress, if you will, the learning for something like this from a whole lifetime to a matter of hours, it's no, no wonder that these types of you know, strategies and patterns that um, are better are going to emerge. It's just sheer computational power that's going to bring that, right? And the positive note on this is not that it beat Lee, but that it actually enhanced the game of Go because now it's being played at a whole new level with this fifth column strategy than what it was before. So, you know, Google itself, right, we are doing, again, we are incredibly passionate about machine learning and AI, and we uh, use this a lot, right, and we think that everybody should have very easy access. So, TensorFlow. Um, is essentially the language that we use for machine learning, and we've sent it out there uh, into the open source community because we want everybody to be able to use it. Um, cloud ML, right, is our, our cloud version of that, and then various APIs that, that you can use to do translation, vision, speech, natural language, that sort of thing. We consume it in, in just about everything that we do, and so we put a lot of research um, effort into these spaces. Remember that pole position? 
It was a couple hundred lines um, when GeoHot did it. Using TensorFlow, you can do it in seven lines. Your model, your learning model then becomes seven lines running against GPUs. Again, this is kind of our usage. Um, this is kind of an internal scan of all the various projects that we have at Google and which one of them have machine learning models embedded in them. And so you can see, right, 2012, that's kind of when Fei Fei and um, um, Jeff started kind of their, their journey with us. 2013, right, started to show some of that value, so we started to include it in things like photos and stuff like that. 2014, it started to go into things like translation and other things. In 2015 and beyond, you know, Gmail, everything. So really, there probably is not one thing that Google does today that doesn't include machine learning or AI to somehow enhance the experience for our customers. And again, this is not a product placement or a pitch for Google. That's not my, my goal here. My idea, the goal here is, is that as machine learning becomes more widespread, as you turn out more students in these fields, right, they are going to be very hot commodities in this market. And our experiences as consumers will be greatly enhanced by these. And it's not just about, you know, games or Google, right? We talked about uh, the oil guys, the Planet Labs, but, you know, machine learning is used so many other places that most people, whoops, that most people don't even realize, right? This is Airbus. Airbus gets paid a bunch of money with their, map, their, their uh, mapping software that the companies use for where they're going to you know, do uh, you know, construction things. And one of the problems that they had was like, as they took an aerial view shot of something, is that snow or is it a cloud, right? It may not sound like much, but if you're trying to sell an area for development, you kind of want to know, right? If it you know, gets a lot of snow or if it, you know, it is, uh, it gets a lot of sunshine, right? If you're gonna sell it for, you know, develop it for farming or whatever else. And so using machine learning themselves, they reduced their error rates from 11% to 3%, which ended up, you know, being hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for them. Ocado, right? Ocado is a, a supermarket in the UK. So again, it's not just high tech companies that are leveraging the fruits of machine learning, right? And that's, again, another thing to bring to your students, right? They needed a way, and I think it's much like uh, the gentleman from IPsoft, I think, had talked to you about, uh, I think, earlier today or yesterday. They needed a way to be much more responsive to their customers, right? If a customer is coming across email or a chat program or the phone, how do I know if they're asking about the uh, status of an order or if they're telling me that they're really mad at me, right, for something, or if they're, you know, just giving us kudos for a job well done? And so they leverage machine learning to be able to monitor all those channels and kind of decide what goes to what department, what goes to what person. Is this person doing sentiment analysis? Is this person happy with us? Or are they angry with us, right? Because, you know, in today's consumer culture, right, you want your, you need that customer intimacy such that, you know, you want your customers to be happy with you all the time. And if they're not, you want to be able to solve that problem as quickly as possible before they get on Twitter. Right? It's a joke that I hear is if you don't have something nice to say, say it on Twitter. <laughs> and so, you know, that's again another application. Uh, QP, right? This is a company that does uh, baby food. And so they use uh, visual machine learning to scan all of their baby food ingredients to, you know, increase their quality um, of the baby food, right? Again, just amazing stuff. And it doesn't have to be high tech. This is one I really, really like. So, and again, it, it isn't just businesses themselves. So what this is, is Global Fishing Watch right, um, is an organization, right, that, that aims to combat illegal fishing in kind of protected areas or illegal fishing of protected species, right, that happen to be in those protected areas. And the problem was in those sanctuaries, it was really hard to tell if a fishing boat was just passing through to go to an actual fishing area or if it was actually doing fishing in that sanctuary, or if they were doing the wrong kind of fishing, you know, dragging the big nets, right, that are very indiscriminate in what they pick up, or if they're doing long line, right, which is, you know, kind of a, a, a better way of doing it, or if they were doing, you know, all sorts of the, the different ways that they can fish, some of them legal, some of them illegal. And so basically what they did is they were able to take these GPS 
um, satellite coordinates, right, that they get from the boats, um, as well as um, photos, right, and be able to plot and use machine learning to understand, is this boat just passing through or, through or are they breaking the law? And so by doing this, they are, they're, I think to date they've been able to level about $2.2 million in fines against shipping vessels that are doing the wrong thing, right? So again, the, the idea here is, is that it's not just about self-driving, it's not just about games, it's not just about you know, the whiz-bang science fiction stuff, right? Machine learning and AI have real-world applicability in almost every part of our lives to make it better. The Cardi's Labs, um, they, you know, they forecast U.S. corn production. Again, much like the oil guys, they want to know, hey, you know, the hedge funds all want to know, um, the, the companies that rely on corn, right, or soybeans need to know what do, what's this year's crop going to look like? Am I going to pay more? Am I going to pay less? Whatever it is. And so they were able to basically, you know, predict the actual U.S. production of these two um, within 1.9% of the actual released um, yield that didn't come out until, what, uh, five months later, right? So again, they're faster and they're incredibly accurate. And so the idea here is that there's a tremendous amount of areas that machine learning and AI can be used in. And you think about this, right, all the way back from, you know, Minsky, it's never going to work, it's a bad idea, right, all the way through George and Geohot and, you know, Feifei and, and all of the people that have added to this at pivotal moments in the evolution of this technology to get us to the point where, you know, it's, it's stopping illegal fishing, right? It's doing things like this, right, that hopefully bring consumer prices down, right? The, the, the things that have happened in machine learning over just the past five, six years are absolutely amazing. We're seeing that applicability um, on a daily basis. A whole host of other areas, right, um, in business, healthcare, you know, energy, financial services, retail, uh, that it's being, that these machine learning is being used on, right, just absolutely amazing. And so the idea is, is that you know, we definitely want you to make sure that you encourage your students to, to think about the applicability of these things because it, it, the opportunity is just massive. So much like that kind of the logarithmic scale, right, um, that I talked about before, if you think about kind of human progress till now, it's been, you know, it's been a nice climb, right? You know, even just in the past hundred years, right, going from you know, horse and buggy to the moon, right? And, you know, hypersonic airplanes, um, just phenomenal progress. But just like we saw with, you know, being able to reduce a lifetime's worth of, you know, intuition and gut instinct learning, right, down into a few hours, right? We're on the precipice of, you know, just this amazing rate of, you know, innovation that's going to be driven by machine learning and AI. And I know there's a lot of ethical questions that we've been discussing throughout the day about how we properly do that. But it's going to happen. We should make sure that we have the right ethical positions in place, but we should, we should make sure that we also embrace this because you know, it's going to drive the human race to a place that we can't possibly even imagine today. Things in medicine and transportation and daily life, right, that sort of thing. So with that, you know, I just want to, you know, the whole goal of kind of what I've been talking about today is hopefully kind of give everybody, you know, the things that I find like really interesting that have kind of punctuated where getting us to where we are today. But I really want everyone here, right, that teaches students or that, you know, creates the environment uh, for these types of innovations to continue and to foster, to take, you know, that passion uh, that you have and, and, and deliver that to the next generation of innovators because that's how we are going to kind of break the bonds of where we are today and get to the next step in, in our evolution. So thank you for your time.